we started to just hold each other so it would just, you know, pass. And it did pass, so thank God we're all okay. It was so fast, we, we didn't have much time, but we already had a place where we were gonna, where we were gonna sit, and uh, it, was really, uh, it was really quick to just get there. Um, and it was, all of a sudden the house was shaking. Well, we'd just been, uh, we were just moving in. Uh, we remodeled it for like eight months, and uh, we moved probably 90% of our stuff in, and the curtains were going to be hung today. And uh, uh, it was a, a new home for my mom, who's 89. Metal sheets in the trees, and my neighbor's insulation is in my trees, and my neighbor's fence is in my yard. I can't even, I'm speechless. Well, we don't think it's going to be necessary. I don't want to leave troops there. It's very dangerous for, you know, we had 28 troops, as it turned out. People said 50, it was 28. And you had an army on both sides of those troops. Those troops would have been wiped out. Uh, I don't think it's uh, necessary, other than that we secured the oil. It's in a little different section, but we just secured the oil. And the other reason, region where we've been asked by Israel and Jordan to leave a small number of troops is a totally different section of Syria near Jordan and close to Israel. And that's a totally different section. That's a totally different mindset. So we have a small group uh, there, and we've secured the oil. Other than that, there's no reason for it, in our opinion. And again, the Kurds are going to be watching. We're working with the Kurds. We have a good relationship with the Kurds. But we never agreed to, you know, protect the Kurds. We fought with them for three and a half to four years. We never agreed to protect the Kurds for the rest of their lives. Remember this. When Iraq was fighting the Kurds, everybody thought we were going to fight with the Kurds. I said, well, it's a little strange that we're fighting with the Kurds when we just spent $4 trillion on Iraq, and now we're going to be fighting Iraq. So what I did is I said, we're not going to take a position. Let them fight themselves. I thought the Kurds would do very well. Everyone said, oh, the Kurds will do very well. Well, Iraq moved in, and the Kurds left. They didn't fight because they didn't have us to fight with. A lot of people are good when they fight with us. You know, when you have $10 billion worth of airplanes shooting 10 miles in front of your line, it's, it's much easier to fight. But with that, they were a good help. But we were a great help to them, too. They were fighting ISIS. You know, they hated ISIS. So they were fighting ISIS. But we never agreed. Where is an agreement that said we have to stay in the Middle East for the rest of humanity, for the rest of, of uh, civilization? to protect the Kurds. It never said that. And we have protected them. We've taken very good care of them. And I hope they're going to watch over ISIS, because that's, again, most of it's not in the safe zone, as we call it. Some places call demilitarized zone. In the old days, we'd call areas like this a demilitarized zone. Uh, and our relationship with the Kurds is good, and they're going to be safe. And I will say this. If shooting didn't start for a couple of days, I don't think the Kurds would have moved. I don't think, frankly, you would have been able to make a very easy deal with Turkey. I think when it started for a few days, it was so nasty that when we went to Turkey and when we went to the Kurds, they agreed to do things that they never would have done before the shooting started. Uh, if they didn't go through two and a half days of hell, I don't think they would have done it. I think you couldn't have made a deal. And people have been trying to make this deal for years. But we're close to making it. We'll see what happens. Again, they've been fighting for 300 years that we know of. 300 years. So why should we put our soldiers in the midst of two large groups, hundreds of thousands, potentially, of people that are fighting? I don't think so. Well, thank you very much. My fellow Americans, I greet you this morning from the White House to announce a major breakthrough toward achieving a better future for Syria and for the Middle East. It's been a long time. Over the last five days, you have seen that a ceasefire that we established along Syria's border has held, and it's held very well, beyond most expectations. Early this morning, the government of Turkey informed my administration that they would be stopping combat 
and their offensive in Syria and making the ceasefire permanent, and it will indeed be permanent. However, you would also define the word permanent in that part of the world as somewhat questionable. We all understand that, but I do believe it will be permanent. I've therefore instructed the Secretary of the Treasury to lift all sanctions imposed on October 14th in response to Turkey's original offensive moves against the Kurds in Syria's northeast border region. So the sanctions will be lifted unless something happens that we're not happy with. This was an outcome created by us, the United States, and nobody else, no other nation. Very simple. And we're willing to take blame, and we're also willing to take credit. This is something they've been trying to do for many, many decades. Turkey, Syria, and all forms of the Kurds have been fighting for centuries. We have done them a great service, and we've done a great job for all of them. And now we're getting out. Long time. We were supposed to be there for 30 days. That was almost 10 years ago. So we're there for 30 days, and now we're leaving. It was supposed to be a very quick hit, and let's get out. And it was a quick hit, except they stayed for almost 10 years. Let someone else fight over this long, blood-stained sand. We are doing our research. We are trying to do our jobs. And there may very well come a time when a peace impeachment is appropriate. Uh, I've said many times that uh, one of the lines for me would be when, when and if the administration disobeys court orders. Because I think I, uh, then we have no, no choice. So we'll see. There's nothing weak about being honorable. You're not a sucker to have integrity and to treat others with respect. I was sitting here and I was just noticing the honorable Elijah E. Cummings. And, you know, this is a title that we confer on all kinds of people who get elected to public office. We're supposed to introduce them as honorable. But Elijah Cummings was honorable before he was elected to office. There's a difference. There's a difference if you were honorable and treated others honorably. Outside the limelight. As Speaker of the House, I have the sad honor and personal privilege to bring the condolences of the entire Congress of the United States to Maya, the Cummings family, the people, the constituents of Elijah's district, people of Baltimore, to our entire country. I say that with great authority because yesterday, my friends and those of you who loved Elijah, yesterday, Maya gave us the privilege of having a celebration of Elijah's life in the capital of the United States. It is no coincidence, is it, that Elijah Cummings shared a name with an Old Testament prophet, <laughs> whose name meant in Hebrew, the Lord is my God, and who used the power and the wisdom that God gave him 
to uphold the moral law that all people are subject to and because of all people are equal. Like that Old Testament prophet, he stood against corrupt leadership of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.